Hello and welcome to Debate IQ, the very first video recorded panel debate brought to you by the IQ team. I'm Vishwa Sadashivan. IQ stands for Inconvenient Questions. We are Singapore's latest socio-political online site. In fact, we just went live today. Debate IQ is a fortnightly panel discussion of a question that you raised that has gained traction. The plan is to go weekly once we have gained momentum. Today's topic or inconvenient question is freedom to express and the right to retaliate. Can one be considered without the other? It is based on but not limited to the unfortunate incidents in France two weeks ago where 12 people were brutally killed by two gunmen in the Paris office of Charlie Hebdo, a satirical publication. And another five more people were killed also in France by another gunman, a total of 17 dead. Europe and most of the Western world and free world have closed ranks in condemning this killing. Now, millions took part in a march of solidarity in France. 40 world leaders, mainly from the Western countries, joined the march. It is noteworthy that even leaders from some predominantly Muslim countries also took part, Egypt, Turkey, United Arab Emirates or UAE. It is just as interesting that President Obama was represented by the US ambassador to France. Now, looking at the response so far, I would say that Europe appears to be even more emboldened and likely to challenge even more provocative with provocative free speech. The US response is clearly tempered and qualified in its advocacy of free speech. Asia, well, well, you could say that Asia has been generally silent. We are certainly at a point of inflection here. The question is, when the dust settles, if it does settle, will there be greater reflection, dialogue, mediation, or have the battle lines already been drawn? Now, what is the role of the United Nations and countries in Asia, for example? What is Singapore's position on the matter? Well, this is what we will examine in the first of a two-part discussion. In part two, we will look deeper at what all this means for Singapore and especially our multiracial, multicultural fabric. To address these and other questions that I talked about, I have with me the Minister for Law and Foreign Affairs, Mr. K. Shanmugam. Associate Professor Kwok Ken Wun, a respected sociologist and associate provost of the Nanyang Technological University, or NTU. And my third panelist is Dr. Nathri Barawi, a cultural critic and expert commentator on multiculturalism and the arts. He's with the Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD, as, as well as the Middle East Institute of the National University of Singapore. I could start with a question for the Minister, um, as, especially as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Um, quite a few people in Singapore that I spoke to were quite surprised and, and troubled that instead of pulling back, there seems to be a push forward uh, and, and almost, as I said earlier, an emboldened position that France is, is taking and Charlie, Charlie Hebdo in particular. As we are aware, they have, on the very next day, gone on to publish and distribute a new edition of the publication of cartoon, and this time again depicting the prophet uh, in, in not very, uh, not very, not very uh, flattering. It's not flattering acceptable way. to not acceptable. Muslims. Yeah. Not at all, you know, and um, and it's troubling. Now, what's your take on it? Why are they doing this? Uh, it's clearly an emboldened position. What are the consequences of, of, of this at a, at a global level? See, every country draws its own boundaries on what is the extent of freedom of speech. France has its limitations. For example, to deny the Holocaust is a crime in France. Yeah, yeah. The European Union has uh, laws on what can and cannot be said. Different countries draw them differently. and. Uh, I think we all agree across the world on one thing. Most sensible people will agree that the attacks were completely unacceptable. Nothing can justify them. And the, the attackers, the terrorists, were misguided in their belief on what their religion wanted. But no one can justify it or accept it. 
that much is clear. Now that does not make what Charlie Hebdo did right. A lot of commentators have come forward and said how can you gratuitously insult uh, religion. France is informed by its own traditions pre-revolution as well as from the revolution. And now I think France will face up to the reality of a multi multicultural society and what lines have to be drawn or may be drawn or may not be drawn. Will they face up to, to, to the reality? Because if you are, if you are, if you, uh, if you are in denial of, of the issue, I mean, I mean basically two wrongs do not make a right. You know, Though there is no moral equivalency between the two. Sure. Yeah. Uh, one could argue that it is disproportionate, that the response could be disproportionate. There are many arguments, yes. but at the end of the day, yes. uh, should not France or should not Charlie Hebdo, for example, take some responsibility for what has happened? Uh, I mean, Kenwood, what is your sense? I have to say this. Uh, you, um, in some ways, right, this is a clash of martyrdoms. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to be very careful about saying this. Uh, in, in the case of some uh, uh, terrorists, they are led to sacrifice their own lives for a cause. And in the process also, this involves killing of others. Mm -hmm. In the case of Charlie Hebdo, uh, it has been documented that um, Mr. Charbonnet has said something to the effect that I would rather die standing than live on my knees. And Charbonnet uh, was, was, uh, yes, was the, the editor, editor who was killed. The, the editor, the editor in chief. Yeah. Uh, so the this deep conviction in his case also for a higher cause. Uh, no doubt there is a fundamental difference. Uh, none of the cartoonists would think that the pen would be so mighty, uh, mightier than the sword, as in uh, killing people uh, as opposed to a, a bullet, uh, which was in, in fact what happened. Bullets killed, killed the cartoonists. But the, the thought that keeps uh, coming to my mind that uh, in the clash of martyrdoms, no doubt not morally equivalent, there are no winners. And there are also no third ways. It is one way versus another way and both are completely absolute. Yeah, but, but the, point, the point that I am making is the current position adopted by mm -hmm. France and to, to a lesser yeah. extent the rest of Europe, so to speak, is that there is only one guilty party in this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most of us, in fact, if all of us would agree that what, what was perpetrated here was wrong, yes. the killing was wrong. But if the other party is not willing to take some part, some, some part of the responsibility, then I think we have got a problem. I mean, e even the Pope today, uh, uh, Pope made, made, made a comment, it is very interesting. He was asked this question, right, and he said, he, he gave the analogy, he said, uh, if you insult my mother, I will punch, I'll punch you in the nose. This is from Pope Francis. So his point is, sometimes the response can appear disproportionate in the conventional term. But if you insult me uh, with something that is very, very much at the core of my being, do not expect me to scold you. I may right. go a few steps beyond that. Now, who is to take responsibility for it? The provocator or the one who is provoked? Right. So very, very quickly, I would also like to caution that uh, when we say France and, and Europe, and more generally the West, uh, I think it, it bears some uh, re, uh, observation that France is in some ways uh, more secular or secularized yeah, secular, yeah. uh, than many other European contexts, and including the US. Uh, their commitment to secularism has had a long history, even as, uh, as recent as uh, September of uh, 2013, there was a secularism charter for the schools yes. and so on. Uh, 
which you don't quite find in other European countries. So. That's true, but yeah. Kenwin, at the same time, the reality, while you want to yeah. be secular, yeah. the reality is they've got the largest percentage of Muslims exactly. in Europe, 7 million Muslims. Exactly. You can't ignore that fact. Uh, can yes. I add something? Uh, you see, your question is focused on Charlie Hebdo and Muslims. Yes. Uh, Charlie Hebdo is well known for being offensive to the Christians as well. Yes. For example, popes with condoms, yes. Catholic nuns masturbating, yes. um, you know, uh, bishops sodomizing each other in the Vatican. Yeah, absolutely. I think in many places all this would be considered unacceptable. So I suppose in France they have drawn the line where they think that this sort of uh, what we would consider to be deeply offensive material targeted at specific religions is uh, acceptable within their framework of uh, freedom of speech. Yeah, but but it's interesting. Nasri, if you could, I mean, you're yeah. an expert, you've commentated quite a bit com on, on intercultural dynamics. Right? Right. I mean, here, if it's an issue of clash of civilizations, clash of martyrdom, clash of, uh, but it's a clash, obviously we're seeing a clash, right. and it's gain, gaining momentum, and it's not just limited to France. That's, right. that's my point. Yes. Okay. There's, there's, uh, there is a it's broader. broader. Yeah. So, if you say it's isolated in France, I think we can, no. we can understand, but it's now gone it's become a European reflex, so to speak. What's your take on that? Right. So first, um, I think we have to look at the idea of uh, free speech in a, in a very nuanced, measured manner. I think free speech, and in this sense, Charlie Hebdo was trying to um, pass it off as satire. Yes, French has a, the, the fr France has a very long tradition of satire, starting back from Voltaire, who wrote Candide, which is a very satirical song. Yes. But we must not forget that the idea of satire is actually a literary phenomenon. Right, so by that I mean that it has to, um, it is not blatant, it is not out there, uh, you know, it's not an insult. And that's what the, the Pope was getting at, that if you insult my mother, I'll punch you in your nose, right? Uh, and, and the idea of satire itself is also quite strong uh, in the Muslim world. It has a long tradition starting from the Arabian Nights, basically, a satire against uh, the monarchy. Right, uh, but as as well as uh, what's happening today in the contemporary Arab world, uh, where we have uh, the John Stewart of Egypt, Bassem Yusuf, uh, who runs a YouTube channel satirizing post uh, Arab Spring, right? Mm. And so this idea of free speech and satire itself is not um, uh, something that is you know a, a European phenomenon or a Muslim phenomenon. I think it's a phenomenon that all countries are interested in, mm. and. Uh, like the minister said, it is the kind of extent to which you, um, uh, you draw the line. Uh, but I, I think what we really need to consider is that in, on all occasions, if we consider it a literary phenomenon and we understand that perspective, then we must understand that whatever is blatant out there is an insult. And we also must take into account the idea of power relations here. And uh, by that I mean uh, when a more powerful group speak out against a less powerful group, uh, that is can be considered bullying, right? Yes. This happens in school as well, the bigger boy bullying the small boy. Now, so if, if you are clearly a minority community mm. and you've yeah. had not a very comfortable life in a particular society, right. and this, is, this actually happens, say for example, in France. Mm. Now clearly, what, from what you're saying, it is not unexpected or not, not unreasonable, unnatural mm -hmm. for the Muslim community, for example, in France, which is a minority, right. to react. Uh, and that's really what's happening. Right. Now, that's, that brings me to the question of the need for laws in, within each society to regulate behavior to some extent. Mm -hmm. Now, we, specifically, I'm talking about uh, anti-blasphemy laws, right? What is interesting is almost all European countries, with the exception of Ireland, I believe, and in, the, in, 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 in North America, Canada, until today, they have not abolished the blasphemy laws. All the others have abolished systematically blasphemy uh, legislation. So I'm wondering whether there's any form of legal recourse that people who feel that they have been insulted, their religion has been insulted, have, have in, in, in European countries. Minister. Is there a European uh is there an ability in Europe to, uh, for people who feel insulted to sue? I think by and large the European approach has been, and in many other countries also, that look, you need to be able to laugh it off. But I think increasingly we have to take note. Our own approach has been, no, you don't expect people to laugh it off. 
you can propagate your own religion, you can talk about your own race, but you cannot insult someone else. That's been our approach. Yeah. I think uh, all I can say to you and as regards Europe is, I think they are finding their way. There are different levels of legislation. And in Canada, the debate is going on. You have the debate in Malaysia yeah. with the Sedition Act. So it's not actually restricted to Europe. Can we? Right. With the tightest of laws, but without a social environment where things can be worked out, tolerated, and or even uh, frankly discussed and so on, um, the laws would be uh, not very, very effective. But just to tie up with the earlier points, there, there is a disconnect between the uh, kind of think, uh, secularist thinking and, the, and y as you rightly put, uh, uh, highlighted, the reality of uh, re religious life and religiosity uh, amongst many people in, in the world. And, and this is where the question of power comes in. Um, the, the world of the Parisian uh, intelligentsia and the world of the, the immigrant uh, in, in, the, yeah. in the poorest of neighborhoods, they are quite different worlds. Yeah. And, and, and then coming back to Minister's point, then the, the question of uh, at the heart of the blasphemy idea is the, the idea of the incitement to hatred right? and how that plays out, especially in groups which are relatively less powerful, not to talk about marginalized, alienated, discriminated, and so on. At least it's quite apparent to us that mm -hmm. the United States is, is distancing itself somewhat from this entire European uh, you know, uh, tsunami, you know, and, and uh, the, the fact that, that President Obama did not go and the ambassador to France represented him uh, is not something that we, should, we can ignore, mm -hmm. right? And, and, uh, and President Obama actually made a statement. I mean, he said um, they will provide France with every bit of assistance in fighting what happened, fighting terrorism. But he also added, when some people see these kinds of terrorists, they conflate them with other Muslims. The point that you made, they're Muslims and they're Muslims, you know. Yes. And it's the extreme right that's going to benefit from this, this, yes. this move. It's the extreme right. So the point that's being made, and, and I believe that President Obama is coming from a very different experience because he's had to deal, America has had to deal with, with this conflation, right? Uh, and, and, and the fight back. And right now, you know, they, they are dealing with black minority communities fighting back and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, that sort of sensibility is needed. Now, the people who are going to be paying a huge price in this entire uh, tirade, so to speak, if, if I can use the word bluntly, would be the majority of Muslims who don't subscribe to violence. That's the majority of Muslims anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Now, what's going to be, what's going to be their, their lot? As somebody answers the question, Vishwa, can yeah. I say this? America has its share of issues as well. Of course. For example, burning of the Quran. You know, we won't allow it. But they apologize for it. Well, they say they it's didn't great, write on but it, but it's not criminalized. It. And uh, it is allowed, and it is put within the framework of a uh, rubric of a freedom of speech. Yeah. And in America, you might almost say the social convention on uh, political correctness perhaps is a, a bigger restraint. Mm. And while there is a lot of talk about freedom of speech, try publishing something that is uh, as offensive as what this magazine has published, but about uh, in an anti-Semitic way yeah. or in some other way. And I don't think you will find much many takers. No. So again, America has drawn its boundaries, and we need to understand that. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, we have to also move away from the idea that moderate Muslims might need to speak out every time uh, such an act occurs, I think. Um, yes, it, uh, it's, it's very useful, um, uh, especially at the start in the post-9-11 world, right, for, for us to keep hearing that. But uh, after a while, it gets to be uh, quite meaningless, I think, uh, when, um, when every time something occurs and the Muslims uh, Muslim communities are expected to, to, to speak out. I'm, I'm not saying that this is not useful. I think it's very useful. But 14 years after 9-11... Right. Can I pick up on yes, that? Please. Especially in, in societies where Muslims are in a minority. And to have the spotlight put on them to be accountable for every other act of 
uh, violence. You know? uh, and and uh, perhaps the words moderate and extreme yeah, too. Yeah, we, we need to, yeah yes. but uh, yes, I, I, I think this is really important uh, to for for non-Muslim voices to to speak and, yes. and 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 in some ways, I'm a little puzzled by what what had happened in France. You see, the world before 7th of January was bad. The world after 7th of January is definitely worse. worse. Not just for Muslims, for everybody. Mm. I, can, can France keep up with be, being a garrison state, uh, protecting every kin kindergarten, whether it's Jewish or, or Muslim, yeah. and, and so on? So it's, it's something beyond, beyond the Muslims. Yeah. But and, and can I make another point? Yes, 7th of January post in uh, before, but you know, in December, if you just think back, there was a Sydney attack. Okay, not as many casualties, but don't forget, Pakistan, 132 children. The Peshawar killing. You know, 132 children, for s broadly similar sort of reasons. Those lives are also precious, and uh, if you look through the last year, almost on a weekly basis, in December and November, Saudi Arabia, Turkey. Australia, France, you are seeing a proliferation with increasing frequency, serious acts committed in the name of religion. And uh, I think we are all moving towards a more and more uh, conflicted, uh, dangerous world. You are absolutely right. It, because it happened in Pakistan, and don't forget the teachers as well. The teachers who died. as well who died. Some, some who, who, yeah. who died because they were trying to save the lives yes. of the others. But, so how do you redress this? How do you redress this obvious shift in, in um, obvious anomaly or, 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 or disproportionate coverage that you get sometimes? You know? and, and if I may just draw your attention to, um, you know, recently this Al Jazeera international inter internal conversation uh, was leaked and I find that interesting because within one media organization there is obviously a huge uh, difference between how the Western journalists look at it and how the non-Western journalists look at it. If I could just quote uh, excerpts of, of it, the Al Jazeera editor uh, uh, Sal Salah al-Din Khad, he said, I quote him, Defending free, he, he sent this email to all the journalists. Defending freedom of expression in the face of oppression is one thing. Insisting on the right to be obnoxious and offensive just because you can is infantile. Baiting extremists isn't bravely defiant when your manner of doing so is more significant in offending millions of moderate people as well. Now, immediately, many of his own correspondents from the West, Westerners, responded. And here is this uh, US-based correspondent, Al Jazeera, Tom Ackerman, his response to what the editor said, and I quote, he said, he argued that cartoons like the ones that, that drove the radical Islamists to murder must be published and continue to be published. And he said, because the murderers cannot be allowed for a single moment to think that their strategy can succeed. Right? So, so this sort of cultural rift, even within an organization, that's supposed to have a collective reflex happens. So it goes back to the point, are we really looking at a clash of civilizations or not? Sam Huntington's theory of clash of civilizations has been rubbished. But what are we seeing? I don't know and how do we I would it? cast it as a cultural rift. I would cast it as, you know, unfortunately this has been cast in terms of freedom of expression mm. versus somebody suppressing my right to express my express. opinion. And freedom of expression is something very basic to a democracy. But, uh, what has not come out enough is the responsibility and the fact that every society draws boundaries. And should you have a right to insult? Now, that doesn't equate with somebody else killing me. But often some of these comments, and a lot of people who say I'm Charlie, are thinking along those lines. Actually, the two should be looked at separately. Mm -hmm. But you know, in the wave of uh, moral outrage, which is entirely legitimate, the two have become conflated. Conflated, and that, but therein lies lies the issue. And and this is probably the the, 
the last point that we, we have time to discuss. So what does this mean for, for, for the rest of the world? I mean, this is not anymore just a, an issue of France. This has become a global issue. And, and this wave that the minister talked about, it, it's going to gain momentum. It's going to gain speed, right? And it's very much going to be Western oriented. I mean, look, when you talk about world leaders, there was not a single Asian leader who was present there. I think it might have been the logistics as well. There wasn't enough time. For example, for That's Singapore. It's too much of a coincidence. Isn't no, it? Logistics. well, I don't know about the others. For example, we, when we got to know about it, it was literally the day after. And, uh, you know, it's difficult for, a, say, a minister from Singapore to fly out to Paris on less than 48 hours' notice. Mm. But to make the point that we stood in solidarity with France, we asked our ambassador to march. So if you're in, I'm not saying their schedules are any easier, but a two-hour difference is slightly different from a 14 or 15-hour yeah. difference. And you know, the French wanted to do it quickly, and uh, they wanted to make a point. And people like us, we wanted to make the point that we condemned these acts. Therefore, while we do not agree with Charlie Hebdo, we took part in the march at the highest level possible for us, our ambassador. Yeah. So, so, Minister, if, if, if I could ask you to succinctly tell us what Singapore's position is, comprehensive position is on this matter. We take society as we find it, which means that you, know, you will have a group of people who are, I could call them postmodernist. You can insult their religion, you can insult them, you can insult their race, and they will treat it as part of freedom of speech. And then you will have another group who will not like it, but who will understand the context. And you will have yet another group who will be deeply offended and uh, will some in that group may well be tempted to do some things. Now, it's not a static situation because it's also these groups are ever-changing and influenced by external events. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we want? At the minimum, we want to avoid violence. And there we have laws which are quite strict. But we want to go beyond that. You want to have a society that has got racial and religious harmony, racial religious peace, mutual tolerance, and in fact, beyond tolerance, acceptance. And uh, in order to do that, we take a very strict view on offending somebody else in terms of race or religion in the name of freedom of speech. So we draw the boundary. You have full freedom of speech but it doesn't extend to offending somebody else. A quick follow-up question, very quickly. What do you think, at a global level, can be done, needs to be done, to help the situation? As, as Ken Moon said, it's gotten worse. How can we bring it back or normalize it? It's a very tough situation, uh, which we have to be honest, because on the one side, you have the conflicts that are going on in Syria and Iraq, which are radicalizing hundreds of thousands of people. And you have the Palestine situation, which is also impacting on the psyche of many Muslims around the world. On the other hand, you have the uh, move in many uh, countries, which over centuries, a tradition of freedom, a certain way of organizing themselves has come up. And for them to change is also not going to be easy. So you're really seeing all of this coming together. And then the terrorism exploding, as I said, in Pakistan, in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Asia, exploding across the globe, no pun intended. So you have a very, very complex situation. And l sensible people, sensible countries will have to now try and find some kind of common ground. But if I may go back to an earlier point, you asked me what's our approach. In fact, in concrete terms, you will find that the latest issue of The Economist is going to be coming out in Singapore with one page blank because they wanted to reprint the uh, latest cover of Charlie Hebdo. Or, you know, they had it in there. No, I mean, it was part of an article. It was a picture there. Mm. And uh, that would not be acceptable to us. So in Singapore, it will not be circulated in that form. Uh, in fact, the printers who are going to print it said they will not print it in Singapore. Mm. So that's our approach. Thank you. Kenwood. In, in the aftermath of this uh, 
very tragic event and every other tragic event. There, we, we have to think about moving on in terms of healing, reconciliation, and so on. And we are now, it, it cannot be a, a world in which equality is, is assumed or, or uniformity or, or one single sort of view of the world can be the view of the world. So I think we, we have to find a way to deal with tensions, uh, dilemmas, contradictions, and uh, it has to be even more, uh, there has to be even more dialogue going on uh, while we are thinking about laws and, and so on. And here perhaps the, 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 the multiple voices and not just from any single community. I think that's very important. As for, as for convictions, beliefs, values, principles, they are translated into action, and action have consequences. So to sort of think about any kind of value, freedom, divorce from the actions and the consequences, not only is not logical, and that too has further consequences. Absolutely. So, so if I could just squeeze this in, and I'm not a, 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 a specialist on, on uh, Islamic theology, but it's very interesting to me, and I think we have to go beyond whether we want to rep reproduce or not reproduce any image. <laughs> because uh, it so happens, uh, quite unique to the Islamic tradition, uh, and you can argue uh, what are the sources of this tradition, in relation to what might be called uh, religious iconography. Mm. In, in, in some other traditions, say Orthodox Christianity, the, the icon points to a kind of uh, transcendental reality uh, which, which has great meaning for the believer. In this case, it's the absence of the icon that is meaningful because the transcendent cannot be expressed yes. in a kind of visual icon. form. Yeah. Yeah. So even to have people understand this very interesting and profound point, I think helps the situation. Yeah. Uh, and this is why uh, you know the, the cartoonists may n may have been bereft of such an idea, yes. so that every other case out there, whether it's the Catholics and, and other, might be the same. They are all they are all equal in a in a, a kind of a, uh, traditional cartooning in which nothing is sacred. Yeah. Yeah. Talking can about can I, can I a lot of great. Great. Yes, please. Yeah. I want to talk about the. Um, you, you mentioned this before, uh, this uh, ethics of respect yes. as, as opposed to uh, uh, dependency on law. And I think it's important to talk about uh, uh, what to do legally, but I think we should move away from uh, a dependency on legal instruments. And, and if we look at this, then uh, there is a sense of ownership from the public to want to see what is right and what is wrong, right? And, and I, I think that uh, if this had if we move along these lines and then um, cartoonists like Charlie Hebdo might have a greater sense of empathy of, yes. of the sensibilities that are sensitive to uh, one community. For example, the Muslims already are a kind of small minority in Europe, uh, but just, just the sensibilities of what might kind of offend um, a, a larger group of Muslims, even though we know there are different traditions of, of Islam out there. Uh, and this, uh, on the part of Muslims, must be carried out. I mean, the Muslims must go and try to, you know, look at different traditions. And, and one of the ways that I personally try to do this is to work with a magazine in London called Critical Muslim mm -hmm. that tries to put out alternative discourses on Islam. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I just wonderful. Yeah. So, so really, gentlemen, what what we're talking about is, let's not start looking at things. Let's not let's not dichotomize, but really looking at it as a con continuum of ideas, and conversations are what is needed and the conversations need not always be in the form of conversations like this they can even be in the form of music and art you know conversations conveyed in the language that the receiver is most comfortable receiving in. and and I think that's something we should explore a lot more that's all the time we have you know and we have come to the end of the first part of a two-part discussion on the topic freedom to express versus the right to retaliate we will be broadcasting part two with the same panelists where we discuss the implications of what has happened on Singapore and our multiracial and multireligious fabric. And be sure to tune in. My thanks to the panelists, Minister K. Shanmugam, 
Associate Professor Kwok Ken Wun and Dr. Nasri Marui. Remember, it's your right to ask the question and theirs to answer it. We make it happen. This has been IQ, Inconvenient Questions.